Good evening. This lecture will be Leilu Nishmat Menachem Ben Moshe Vedorit, Leilu Nishmat Shaili Bat Moran, Lerfuat Anefesh of Yonatan Ben Bela, Lerfuat and Atzlacha Vezivug Itai Ben Esther, Leilu Nishmat Miriam Bat Yafa and Yosef Ben Miriam. Uh, for success and parnasa tova, good health and simcha uh, uh, and osher of Masuda bat bracha. Also for Eduardo ben Beatriz, that should do tshuva, full repentance. Also, that's it. I think I cover all the names. It's good to be back after more than a month that I haven't been here. People forgot about me, I see. I said, I need a reminder that I'm back. That's the good news. The bad news is that next week is no shiur, because it's Rosh Hashanah. And we have to see before Yom Kippur, maybe. We have to look at my schedule, when it's going to be the next lecture. It's very possible now we go to another month of, uh, of a break with the holidays. Uh, before I tell you a little bit about my experience on my trip in Israel, I just want to make one announcement for every year we do a Yom Kippur in Englewood, New Jersey for more than 15 years. I want to remind all the people that come every year, they have to let me know if they're coming. Anyone new who wants to join us, I stay by my friends in a very big house with lots of rooms. We pray there, we have shiurim there, we, we sleep there, everything is there. And we have a meal after the fast as well. It's an amazing experience. For those who came, they already know what we're talking here about. Also, also, I brought from, uh, from Israel tefillin and mezuzot, but I got to bring five very, very special pairs of tefillin. Five, very hard to get. It's 100% handmade from the beginning to the end, with no, with no electric, with no machines, everything handmade, which is, makes it probably four or five times longer to make. Much like the time of Moshe, of Moses in the old days, when, when before there was electric. With electric, it's a shortcut. It saves a lot of time. The machine does the job, but it's not as authentic as the original way of Hashem. Tefillin like this is very hard to get. They don't use glue. It's all handmade. It's unbelievable pairs. The sofer is a sofer that writes the, the parashiot that was recommended by Rav Ovadia Yosef, Talmid Chacham. Basically, it's the most perfect tefillin you can get on earth. Tefillin like this, usually in a store, would be more than $5,000, but the problem is that you cannot find such pairs in stores. Stores don't bring this kind of quality. And over here, you can get it for, for a lot, a lot less money. Anyone who is interested, move quickly, because by the end of the week, I believe they all be gone. So it's hard to get. Believe me, I work very hard to get those kind of tefillin. The only reason I get it, because the person who made it, I made him Baal Tshuva 23 years ago. So he's embarrassed to tell me no. It's very interesting. There are two people that make this kind of tefillin. And both of them are my, my Baal Tshuva. One from 25 years ago, one from 23 years ago. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> Unbelievable. They became world expert in making batay tefillin. World expert. And one without connection to the other. It's not that one knew the other and taught him the job. Each one of them separately went into this thing, worked in it for many years, until they reach the highest level. One of them is even coming here to give uh, speeches in Lakewood Yeshiva to the big rebbes about batet filin. It's unbelievable how many things you have to know to produce a very high level pair of filin. Very, very, so many steps until, from the minute it was a cow, until it became skin and you remove the hair and you process the skin and you make parashiot, lishma, it has to be for the sake of tefillin. There's so many steps, probably hundreds of steps, and if one of them goes wrong, it makes everything not kosher. So this is Mamash, a work of art, and we're lucky that they do it in Israel. If they would have to do it here in America, a pair of tefillin would be like this, $20,000. 
based on the amount of time, based on American labor. But Baruch Hashem, he comes from Yerushalayim. Okay, so this is uh, the, that specific announcement. Baruch Hashem, I was in Israel almost a month, 25 days. We had a very successful seminar. As usual, many people become Baalei Tshuva by the end of the weekend. And they take tzitzit, they accept on themselves to keep Shabbat. They take the USB with thousands of hours of lectures. They grab the books. I send the videos on a group, like I do after every seminar. And plus, I had 16 other lectures. And each lecture was preparation for the Judgment Day Rosh Hashanah, as we're going to discuss a little bit tonight and tomorrow night. Also Wednesday, I'm going to be in Great Neck by Rabbi Alon Shul. So we have three lectures back to back every night. Plus, we have a Saturday night in Or Natan, the last lecture of the Hebrew year. It's going to be 11 p.m., followed by Slichot in the new Or Natan in Queens Boulevard there. So anyone wants to come to an inspiring night with Slichot, Pezrat Hashem. Tov, Baruch Hashem, we are now less than a week from the Judgment Day. And uh, I, come, I came back from Israel. I've seen a lot of young boys and girls, Baruch Hashem, getting inspired, coming to the Slichot, starting to get involved in religion. That's the good news. The problem is that the amount of bad news over there is so huge that it, it rips the heart to hundreds of pieces when you see what's happening now in Israel. It's much breaking the heart. First, the Arabs in the last year made such a damage in Israel like they haven't done in seven years combined because of this trader government that went together with them and gave them 54 billion shekel. They feel like they own everything now. They steal more than 50,000 cars per year. They brought Israel to such level that the police don't show up anymore. As of a month ago, the police announced, <clears throat> we can't deal with the crime. We're very sorry. We don't have enough people. In Jerusalem alone, they steal 50 cars every night. 50 cars a night in Jerusalem every night. They have statistics the police published. They come in less than five minutes. They start your car. They drive it to East Jerusalem. It takes them five to ten minutes. By the time you find out your car is stolen, it's too late. The Israelis, they have cameras everywhere, the police. The camera can detect a stolen car while it's driving. They have, the Israelis are number one in the world in technology, but not, sometimes it's not enough. Because if you find out within five minutes or ten minutes that your car was stolen, and you call the police and they enter it to the computer, and this Arab drives on the way to East Jerusalem, and one of the cameras find him, immediately they can come and block his way and catch him before the car passes the border. The problem is that in 99% of the time, by the time you find out your car is stolen, it's already taken apart already. And they steal it and they take it apart. They don't keep it as it is and they sell the parts. And they love hybrid cars because just the battery alone is 35,000 shekel. And that's how they do it. And there's nothing you can do. They smile in your face. They don't care. They're not afraid. The police don't show up. The police say, I'm sorry. We don't have time to come. So what happened? You have to go to the police. All right. So you go to the police the next day. Every station you come, they say, we're too busy. You're not a priority for us. We have a lot of urgent things. You want to sit and wait more than three hours? Be my guest. Obviously, nobody has three hours to sit. Plus, they're not guaranteed that they will take your complaint. You can sit three hours and they tell you, sorry, we can't do it today. So obviously, no one will stay. So I so, so what should I do? Go to a different station. OK, so you go to a different station. You show up. What? I, I, I came to file a claim. The car was stolen. We don't have an investigator here. And lanu choker po in this station. So what should we do? Go to another station. You come to another station. You walk in. Who sent you over here? 
if the car was stolen in that part of Jerusalem, why you came to here? You should have gone around somewhere local. So they said they, they don't have uh, enough people. They call up the chief of the station. Do you see what's going on over here? They send us their work to here. Nobody wants to work. COVID destroyed the world. Destroyed the world. They don't want to put five, six minutes to file a report and give you a report, because without this, you're never going to get the insurance money. You need that report. They don't want to give it to you. Not only they don't come to the place, even when you go to them, they don't want to do it. Why? The amount of crime between Jewish criminals and Arab criminals is so high, they can handle the pressure. That's what happened to society. It became so wicked and so corrupted that we lost control. That's it. The world became a total anarchy, chaos. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what's happening here. So I'm not talking about all the girls that they steal, all the Jewish girls, naive girls. They give them drugs. They take them to their places with their nice fancy cars. They have the life in Israel. Everyone is shaking from them. They don't pay taxes. They only take from the government. They give nothing in return. They only have rights. The secular lefty idiots give them priorities before they give any Israeli anything, they will give it to them. So they, when they build, they don't need permit. They build as much as they want on any property they want, even if they don't own the land. They just expand. Nobody makes a beep. They don't need a permit to build. They don't need a certificate of occupancy. They do whatever they want. They leave as many people as they want. They build as many floors as they want. And if the Israelis will ever dare to go to one of the villages to break one of their house, they come a thousand people in less than a minute, and they blow them up. <clears throat> Nobody wants to go. You tell the police, go and make some order over there. Leave us alone. We have enough problems. The problem is that, you know, just like the cancer growing in the body, it doesn't remain in one organ. It goes to another one and another one until it kills you completely. So now it's all over Israel. It's in Jaffa, in Haifa, in Akko. It goes in Be'er Sheva. It goes in all the south and all the Galilee and all the Arab villages. It's the cancer is spreading everywhere to the point that one day you, were gonna, you would like to drive from one place to another. You won't be able to go through. You're going to have, you know, all kinds of obstacles that they're going to stand on the way and bomb you with rocks, just like they do everywhere in Jerusalem by the Kotel, life became very difficult, very, very difficult. So at this point, and I'm sad to say it, that the way I look at things, we already lost Israel. That's it. There's only one way to save Israel. One is, of course, if Hashem will send the Mashiach, obviously. And if the Mashiach will not come, the Messiah is not going to come, you have to multiply the amount of police and army in Israel at least by 10 times. Not twice, 10 times. If you have right now, I don't know, 30,000 police, you have to bring it up to 300,000. If you have 50,000 police, you have to bring it up to half a million police. For every 10 citizens, you're going to have a policeman. There's nothing you can do about it. Because this is a world of criminals. And there are many, many criminals. Now remember, the Arabs are very violent. There's no such thing to come to them and ask them to put their hands behind their back or anything like this. It's always end with riots and rocks and shooting. Every time they go to look for someone that is, is terrorist, it's always a battle. There's always shooting. There's always someone get hurt. It never comes, oh, OK, yeah, you're looking for me? Here I am. Arrest me. There's no such thing. So as a result of that, the police is afraid. They're afraid. They're going to come five, six guys, and 500 terrorists will come. So you need to come with an army. 
So you have to recruit tens of thousands of new police to save Israel before it's too late, if it's not already too late. It may be already too late. So we might as enjoy it as long as we can. How long? Five years? Ten years? Unfortunately, this is what it is. I, I know I'm saying very difficult things here. I'm realistic. I wish I can give you better news. I see what's happening there. I have saw this month such a disaster, and I've been going back and forth to Israel for 30 years. It's nothing new. It's never been so dangerous like it was in the last month. And this is results of this trader, Bennett and Lieberman and all these traders. They went together with the Muslim brothers. They gave them everything. They bribed them to stick, to stay in the government. That one year that I had to bribe them made us a unbelievable damage. Unbelievable damage. Now we're facing another election. Will the righties will form a government? It, it doesn't look like it. It looks like the same situation, like the other four elections. 60-60. 60% right, 60% left. You need 61 and up. 61 is not a good, it's not a healthy government, because if one person is sick and he doesn't come for the vote, your government collapse. If the opposition vote against you and two or three people are not today in the Knesset, that's it, the government collapse. You need minimum 65 to have some spares. Somebody overseas, you have to call him quickly, come back to Israel, why? Right? There's a vote tomorrow morning. You can run a government like this. So this is what's going on, Rabotai. That's what's going on over there. We'll see, we'll see where it's gonna lead us. We ho really hope that Hashem is gonna do something about it. If he doesn't, I don't really know what's, where we're gonna be in 10 years from now. Little things that are happening here now today in, uh, in Turkey, there was big demonstrations against the gays. Thousands of people marched on the streets of Turkey, started to scream that they're sick and tired of these psychos and if they want to live their lifestyle against God, they should move to Holland. I don't know why they chose Holland. I guess in Holland it's free over there, you know. So the, 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 the Turkish, which are Muslims, Muslims, Goim, not Jews, they protest against these wicked people who call themselves gays, whatever they call themselves. And they, they are, they're sick and tired of them. So we don't want you in, your, in our country. You know if something like this would happen in Israel, the media will butcher you. Racist, homophobe, they have words. But in Turkey, the media supports them because it's all under Arduan, which is, is also Muslim. Actually, some of his students were marching on the street. But the, the way the world became is that any time you want to protest against something that is against Hashem, immediately the lefty mafia all over the world is well connected. Immediately they begin to act against you. United Nations, this one, that one, this organization, United States. Immediately they put their, they bully. They bully you. Oh, you don't want to give them rights? We're going to cut you from here, we're going to cut you from there. You cannot join the European Union. That's what they do. They put a gun to your head. You're going to go against God with us, or we're going to take actions against you. Remember, democracy only exists for those wicked people. Anyone who is righty or is normal, or he wants to live by the, by the laws of God, is not welcome in this world, in most countries. So when I see that countries like Iran and Turkey, not that I support them, I'm the last person who have any sympathy to them. They are the enemies of Israel, make no mistake. But when I see our enemies having higher level of ethics and morality, then I know that we are going through a major suffering coming to us. 
Because when our enemy are trying to do more the will of God than us, the Jewish people, the chosen people, what do you think the Satan is going to do? When he comes in front of Hashem in Rosh Hashanah in six days, he's going to come and wave with anything he can to bring us a horrible year to come. One of the things the Satan is going to use is look at those Muslims and look at your children, the Jewish people. And you tell me, why should you choose the side of the Jews when half of them or 80% of them are liberals, lefties, right? And the other ones, they are pro all kinds of negative things that you hate. And in, the, and in Iran and in Turkey and some other Arab countries, they don't allow, they do not allow the things you ate. So who care about you more? Your children or the strangers? What are we going to do? That's a very solid claim. Hopefully we will have enough Torah in the yeshivot to balance the situation. Meaning that Hashem can come to the Satan and say, you have a point, but you forgot that there are 200,000 Jews sitting in yeshivot, or more, 300,000 with the children, it could be 400,000. There are 400,000 of my children sitting from morning to night and learn Torah. And every minute of Torah, it's a thousand mitzvot. Count how many billions of mitzvot are done in the world every day, thanks to my children. They are actually saving the world from a full destruction. So you are bringing some Muslims who demonstrate against the gays, yes, but there are many Jews who are against it as well, at least half. Just because they're not violent and they don't riot on the streets, and they're not scary like those who walk in the streets of Istanbul or in Iran, it doesn't mean they don't care and they don't have the pain to see it. There's only one problem, that in the Torah, the Torah demand the Torah demand to protest. When you see something against Hashem in front of you, you have to protest. You can say, oh, I'm against it, but there's nothing I can do. Because if you do nothing about it, unfortunately, it's count like you allow it to happen. So this is another thing that happening today in the world, you know, that we should know, should be aware of what's happening around us. One more thing. There was a, a very big tragedy this week in Israel, a very misfortunate mistake, very misfortunate mistake. As you know, 15% of, of the Jewish couples cannot have children in a natural way. So they need treatment. They have all these treatments that they do in labs. They fertilize the egg with the sperm and implant the fertilized egg in the, in the woman's womb and it develops sometimes a baby or twins sometimes. Sometimes people freeze these fertilized eggs with the sperm of the husband that in case the treatment won't work, they will have more when they're getting older, so they freeze a bunch, 20, 25, whatever the case is. In the hospital in Israel, by mistake, they took fertilized eggs of a couple, let's call them X and Y, and used it by mistake for another couple. They mix between them. And a woman became pregnant, she has a baby, and now they did some kind of a DNA to check this, the, 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 the baby, and they found out the baby does not belong to this husband and wife. And they checked for all the people that were in a bank in a hospital, and they locate the real parents. So now imagine this. You come, you freeze eggs from your wife, and from, you know, sperm inside. Each one of them is a potential life, or maybe twins. When you are sure that the Israeli hospital, Israeli hospital, we're not talking about uh, Zimbabwe here, you know? This is an Israeli hospital. It's a European standard. 
So you would think that they know what they're doing. So they take the wrong eggs and put it in the wrong woman, and now it's a disaster. Now we are going into one of the hardest things in halacha, in Jewish law. Who is the mother of this baby? The mother that contributed the wound or the mother that contributed the egg? It's become a legal issue now. The Israeli judges, which their knowledge is in a level of kindergarten, when it comes to questions like this, I have no idea. The law does not give answers to this question. And even if the law would give an answer to this question, the Israeli law, these judges are so behind, I see their level. I see some of the rulings. You don't know if these people are normal. Forget about judges. You see the ruling in some of the things in Israel. You wonder to yourself where these judges came from. But to give them the benefits of the doubt, this issue is difficult not only by a secular court, it's difficult by the highest level in Torah, among the biggest rabbis of today's time. Because remember, uh, 50 years ago, these things did not exist. You couldn't take an egg from one place and a wound from another place and a sperm from someone and mix all of them together and, and create a baby. You didn't have these options. So according to the Torah, you see where the baby came from. A woman give birth to a baby, the baby came from a Jewish mother, she's the mother, and if she's Jewish, she's Jewish. And if she's a Goya, he's a Goy. Very simple. However, when we know today, with the help of a microscope, that there are seeds, tiny microscopic seeds, and there are microscopic eggs, and they can fertilize them artificially, and planted it in a wound, they can make a big salad here. These things the Torah did not discuss. Now you have to use common sense to try to understand who really gave life to that baby. Is this the, the contributor of the egg or the one that has the wound? So most rabbis hold in the opinion that where the baby came from, that's his identity. And this is his mother. The minority claimed that the contributor of the egg, that's the real mother. My opinion personally, not that I'm in that league, but if you care about what my opinion is, I think like the minority, not like the majority. The reason I think so is like this. Today with the science, we are very advanced. I'm sure that it's a matter of months or years that you will be able to create life of a baby from A to Z only in an incubator. Today, if you're born in a six, seven month, they can continue the development of the baby in an incubator. The incubator is giving what the wound would give, right? The last two, three months of the pregnancy. So you see that they have a solution which Few years ago, they didn't have. 50 years ago, if a baby was born in a six or seven month, it would die. It wouldn't survive, even in the eight month. But today, with the help of incubators, which creates the same atmosphere like in a womb, it actually completes the development of a baby and eventually goes home and grow up to be a normal person. So the question is, what would happen if they will take the seed of a husband and the egg of a mother fertilize it artificially, and develop it from A to Z in an incubator without any mother, meaning no wound. Who is going to be the mother of this baby? The incubator? What are we going to say? Is the son of an incubator? What's this incubator? Is it going to be a Jewish incubator or a Goyish incubator? Then we're going to run into a very big problem. According to the majority of the rabbis, then when you come back to them and say, what are you going to say now? According to you, the egg is not the mother. The wound is the mother. And if there is no wound, there's only incubator, then what are you going to do? So it's very, very likely that the egg is actually what gives the life. Without the egg, there's not going to be a life. The one who gives the egg is probably the real mother. 
The reason the Torah didn't discuss it, because in the old day there was no difference. The egg and the wound is the same thing. There is no way to separate them. But today, when we have a way to separate them, we have to rethink how to analyze this issue and to make rules. And it's not that easy. Same thing when, with the, when extending life with machinery. 50 years ago, if somebody is dying, he's dying, that's it. There's no way to revive him with the artificial uh, machines. Today, if someone stops breathing on his own, they have all these machines that can keep him alive another month, or more even. Without those machines, he would be dead already, a month ago. The machine's giving him extension of life. It can be maybe three months. The question is, if naturally he was already dead a month ago, when, once we connected him to this machine who extends his life, is he considered alive or dead? Because according to the Torah, he was supposed to die a month ago. But now we have machinery that we didn't have two or three thousand years ago when the Torah discussed about life. According to the Torah, as long as you breathe, you are alive. Once you are unable to breathe, you die. The soul leaves the body. Kol asher neshama be'apo. Every creature that has a soul in his nostrils, meaning he didn't exit, the soul, the soul enter into the nostrils, and the soul exits through the nostrils. This is how Hashem made it. He goes through the af, the nose. So the question is, if there was no machine, in a minute or two, the soul would exit the body, and that would be the, the end of his life. Now, con quickly, they connected him to the machine, they have electric, they have all kinds of things, and all of a sudden, he's able to live. The question is, what happened now, after they revived him, if they want to remove the heart from him and transplant the heart to someone who is about to die. If we will say that he is considered already dead from the minute he couldn't bring on, on his own without machinery, then it's not a murder. The fact that he took the heart out and saved the life of another person was a big mitzvah. He just saved someone's life. What about him that he just died after you pulled the heart out? He was dead anyway. The machine continued to revive him artificially. But from the Torah, he was already dead. But if we're going to say, Hashem changed one rule in nature. Until now, the only way to live was naturally. Now, Hashem created a way to extend life with the machinery, just like with medicine, just like with surgeries that didn't exist 500 years ago. There are certain things today that we go to an easy minor surgery and it saves our life by cutting something or separating something or sewing something or you know, removing something. But in the old days, if someone had it, he would be dead. That's it. But today, with the, with the knowledge we have in medicine, we save millions of lives with all kinds of surgeries that are not even so complicated. You go in and out two or three hours, and you're out and you're alive. You wouldn't do the surgery, you'll die. The surgery saved your life. The question is now, if your life was saved by surgery, no one is debating that you're still alive. Are we going to say, no, no, he's dead already. What do you mean? He's only 40. No, no, he's dead because the, the, the open heart surgery made a bypass, and it opened the clogs and all these things. So thanks to that, he's alive. Oh, so according to nature, he was dead already. So we did something. We gave them extra 30 years of life. These 30 years, is considered alive or dead? There's not one person in the world that would count him as dead. He can still have children. That's a very complicated thing. So today, believe it or not, we don't know 100% what's considered the moment of death in Shamaim, in heaven. We don't know. Is it considered the moment of death is when you stop breathing on your own? Then that's officially when Hashem announced you die. Or because they give you extension of life, then you consider still alive. Because we don't know, we cannot take a risk of murdering anyone. What if he's still considered alive in the eyes of God? Disconnecting him from the machine is actual murder. 
100% murder, because you shorten his life by a week, by a month. Shortening the life of a person by one minute is already a murder. Even if you know for sure in one minute he's going to die, and you shorten his life by a minute, you are 100% a murderer. If there was Sanhedrin today, you would get an execution and die for murdering this person. Even if you only stole a minute from his life. One minute is eternal. Do you know how much a Jew can do in one minute? Enough, he's talking to Hashem before he dies. I'm sorry for everything I've done. Forgive me. Give me another chance. Something. He changed his entire status in Shamaim. You avoided that minute from him. That's a very big problem. So Rabotai, because we don't know, if we already connected someone to the machines, we have no permission to disconnect. Do we have an obligation to connect him to the machine? Oh, that's another issue. Since Hashem gave us this option to extend life artificially with equipment, are we obligated to extend life or are we allowed to leave our parents to die naturally? Do we have an obligation to extend their life or no? In other words, if now an 80 years old woman comes to the, to the hospital and the doctor say, if we're not going to connect her to the machine, in three hours she'll be dead. If we connect her to the machine, she'll live maybe two or three more months. Now, the, the, the kids of this woman who have to fill up the paperwork, do they have an obligation to extend the life? Or they should say, don't use equipment, let her live or die by the will of God. He wants her to live, he knows how to keep her alive. He doesn't need machines. If he wants her to die, he, she would die with the machine. It's in the end of Hashem. That's one opinion. Second opinion say, no, it's not true. There are many things in life that Hashem gave us solution for the problem, which we didn't have before. For instance, 50 years ago, if a woman has problems with, uh, with getting uh, you know, pregnant, she cannot get pregnant. Did we have a solution for it? No. She would remain barren for the rest of her life. Now, there are solutions. They do all kinds of things and they give birth. So what, we sh what should we say? How, how, how did you dare to interfere with the laws of nature? This woman is barren. Or oh, this guy, his sperm is not as good, or whatever the case is, he cannot enter the thing. Why are you going to do it artificially? 50 years ago, nobody could have done it. They didn't have the, the knowledge or the, the equipment to do it. Now they do. Since Hashem gave the solution to the problem, are we obligated to use it to ease the suffering of people? Or we have to stick to the old-fashioned, natural way, and whatever happened in the old days, that's what should happen in these days. What's the answer? Rav Moshe Feinstein, which was the biggest posek in America history, the biggest rabbi in America's history when it comes to halacha, was definitely Rav Moshe Feinstein. He was one of the biggest in the world, very holy man with perfect midot and unbelievable knowledge of Torah. If you read his book, Drash Moshe, about Parashat HaShavua, if I would tell you the Rambam wrote it, you would believe. His language is like someone who lived eight, nine hundred years ago. And he only lived 30 years ago in Lower East Side. Such a holy person. His language is so hard to understand. It's so deep. It's so ancient that you know this is definitely a soul of somebody huge who came back to the generation to help. It's not a regular person. The opinion of Rav Moshe Feinstein, which makes a lot of sense to me as well, not that he needs my approval, of course, but I always want to hear the opinion and see which one you, you, you feel more comfortable with. His opinion is, when Hashem gave an ease to the generation, a way to do things in an easier way, we have an obligation to use it. If someone will die without it, what, you're going to let him die if there is a way to keep him alive? Just because in a natural way he's going to die. So Hashem gave the solution to the problem. 50 years ago, Hashem wanted people in this problem to die. 
Now he gave a solution to make them not die. Can we sit and, and watch him dying when we know by pressing few buttons and connecting few wires we can save his life? Or give electric shock to a person in the ambulance and make his heart work again? Should we let him die because 50 years ago we didn't have these electric shots? However, not everyone agree with that. For instance, the opinion of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, <laughs> which was, knows the entire Torah from A to Z when he was in his 60s, just passed a year ago. Yeah, it was 93, I believe, 91. So already 30 something years ago, he had full knowledge in the whole Torah. Imagine now another 30 years of learning. His opinion was that you should not interfere with birth. Should not create in a lab, put the seed in the egg, fertilize it, put it in a wound. You shouldn't do it. You have to trust Hashem, pray. If Hashem wants you to get pregnant, you should get pregnant. I wish I could go and ask him when he was still alive, okay, based on this opinion, does it mean also that you also against extending life? Because it's a little bit similar. Maybe, maybe then it's a different, different, uh, different opinion. Maybe when it's pikuach nefesh, he would agree to use the equipment because it's a life risk. But to create babies, maybe already has different reason why he doesn't want. That's, those things are very, very complicated. You only understand how complicated they are when you speak to two giants in the Torah and hear their entire opinion. And then you have to decide which one of the two you are identified with. Since it's very complicated and you don't have the knowledge to understand what they even say. <laughs> we have to wait for the Mashiach to come and answer us all these dilemmas. One way or the other, Abotai, the opinion of Rav Ovadia Yosef was that you're allowed to donate organs to people that are about to die, because according to the Torah, you are considered already dead. Rav Eliashiv, which was older than Rav Ovadia, was also the Gdolador, Rav, Ova, Rav Eliashiv say you're not allowed, because the person is still alive, thanks to the machine, but he's still breathing, still have pulse. Taking organs out of him is actually murder. So you have two giant Chachamim who actually sat together in the same Jewish court as three judges, three Dayanim. Rav Eliashiv was older, so he was the head of the Bedin, and Rav Ovadia was a young judge sitting together in the same group to rule about certain topics. According to Rav Ovadia, it's a mitzvah. He can save the life of four people that are about to die. Take kidneys from here, take the heart from there, take the liver from there, and you may save four people that are about to die because he is anyway dead. The machine can only give him X amount of weeks or X amount of days. Take advantage on those days and save the life of others. But Rav Eliashiv said we don't have permission to save the life of 10 by speeding up the death of one person. There used to be Rav Ashri in the Holocaust. He was the posek of the, of the concentration camps. He was a very, very short man. I knew him personally. I lived in Lower East Side at the time when he was still alive. And I actually brought him to my son's breed to make the brachot. Rather schut to bring such a holy person. He was the, 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 the rabbi of all the hardest questions that people had to ask in the middle of the Holocaust. So he obviously was such a holy man that he never lifted his face from the ground. When he walked in Lower East Side with his cane, you would never see him bringing up his, his head up. Always look down. Why? The world was a zoo around. He doesn't want to see things that are not modest. They asked him that question in the Holocaust, similar question, not exactly the same. They asked him a similar question. They asked him, since the Nazis made the Jews walk three days barefoot on the ice with no food, and they had to just walk. They tortured them by making them walk. And they are so hungry, and every 
few minutes, one of them would fall and die from hunger. So there were dead bodies on the side of the road that died an hour ago, two hours ago, five hours ago. They are laying on the snow on the side. So they ask if they are allowed to eat their bodies to survive. Like to run and bite some piece, bite it, swallow it, as terrible as it sounds, that's the only thing that can keep you alive. If not that, in five hours from now, you'll be dead. You understand? When you have such a shalom situation, we cannot even imagine how can you ask such a question. But when you're about to die any minute, and you want to hold on to life, believe me, you will eat rats, and you will eat snakes, and you will eat dead bodies, just not to die. Some people would say, no, I'd rather die than to do this. Just take me and that's it. They give up. Not everybody gives up easy on life. Some people do everything you can imagine just to survive. So they asked him, are we allowed to eat those bodies? Because we have an, the dignity of the dead person to cut pieces from his body. What we call in America, autopsy is not permitted in the Torah. You're not allowed to open the bodies and do all kinds of uh, investigations, how he died. You're not allowed. You have to keep the body in place full and bury it full. So the question is, if they're going to start biting into bodies, the body's going to have holes. So that's obviously a sin. But because life risk prevent even Shabbat, needless to say, the, the dignity of a body, therefore it would be permitted. However, Rav Ashri ruled that you're not allowed to do it. Why? Because not everyone is fully dead. Just because you see a person dead, laying dead, and you check his pulse and you don't hear pulse, the pulse is very weak because his soul is already exiting the body in the last five hours, little by little. That means every minute he's dying a little more, a little more. But he's already in such a situ situation that if you try to find pulse, you won't hear anything. Why? Because he's 90% dead already. Dead is not an instant thing. It takes time for the soul to leak out. So how do you know? Maybe this person is still 10% alive, and you're going to cut him out, or you're going to do something, and now you're going to rush his dead. So it's not allowed. Or even if you see that he's about to die, but you don't have that much time. You have exactly a minute, because you have to walk with the, with the march. So you have only one minute next to that body. And, and if either you, you take a piece now, or when you walk, that's it. You don't have that opportunity. So you see that he's dying, you choke him. You choke him, anyway he's gonna die. It's a matter of minutes or maximum an hour, he's gonna be dead anyway. He's on the side of the road. So you will rush his death by an hour or by five minutes. That's a murder. Are you allowed to murder someone else to save your life? No, that's one of the three things you're not allowed to do. You're not, if, if your life is in a risk, you're allowed to break Shabbat. If your life is in a risk, you're allowed to, to do many things. There are three things you're not allowed to do to save your life. To worship an idol, to do Gilui Arayot, and to murder someone else. Those three, you're not allowed. You have to die and not agree to do. So Rav Ashri, with his brilliance, he knew that there's going to be situations that the people are not fully dead, and they're going to speed their death by choking them. You go like this. A person can barely move anyway, and he's, you're going to kill him 20 minutes before he was supposed to die anyway. But this 20 minutes is critical. He's going to have to come back in reincarnation just for that. To be born and die in 20 minutes in hospital. 20 minutes after birth. It happens. Sometimes you hear babies in two hours died. Five hours after giving birth, all of a sudden the baby died. You wonder why was he born to die? That's one of the reasons. It's old people that they rush their death by few hours or by few days. They have to complete what was taken from their life. So they come back in reincarnation sometimes for a week, sometimes for three days, sometimes for three hours. Sometimes even for a few minutes, they die in the middle of birth. Why? 
because the, the, only, the entire purpose of this pregnancy was for that soul to come back to the world for that hour. So obviously, I don't have to tell you, the people that rush someone's death, how much they make Hashem angry. That now he has to send back the soul again for nine months of pregnancy, for the woman to give birth for one hour and cause so much pain to the parents and to the relatives just to pay back for the one hour that you disconnected him from the machines or something like that. So now, Baruch Hashem Rabotai, yeah, unfortunately, everything is from Hashem. It's going to be a big legal battle in Israeli court. Who really have the rights to raise this child? The biological parents of the, that contributed the seed and the egg? Or the mother who contributed the wound? Don't expect Israeli secular gay judges to give you the answers for that. Because even big rabbis cannot give you a definite answer for that. You have to know that. Regular judges in Israel, most of them are lefty, pro-Hamas, pro-Arabs, hate religion, pro-gays, or are gays themselves. Those are the judges that sit in the Israeli court, just like the judges that sit here in America or in Europe. You expect from people like this to define what's life and death and who's the mother? <laughs> With what knowledge? With the Torah that is wider than the ocean, it's difficult to give a definite answer. With secular studies, you're going to be able to give the... I remember the controller of New York State, Alan Avesey, which I sat with him for three hours here in Queens one time. He told me that he once sent a letter to the judge in the Supreme Court, and that time, which probably took 30 years ago, and asked them for the Supreme Court to define, according to the United States Constitution, to define the time of death. Because that, it's not defined in the Constitution. And he said to me, the judge sent me a letter back, Mr. Avesey, I'm begging you. Please don't ask me to play God. Don't get me into that place. Meaning I'm afraid. What if I make a mistake and I define the time of death and I'm wrong? Do you know what consequences is going to be to it? I'm going to be the reason why so many people got away with murder or so many people were guilty of something they never committed. I cannot blame that judge. <laughs> That's a very complicated thing. You see, even in Jewish law, there is arguments about it. You ask the American judge to decide. Tov, let's move on. I don't know if you heard the news. Somewhere here in New York, a teacher come for a job interview. Hi, my name is such and such, female. They give her the job. And later they find out it's actually a man. A man that became a woman. This is a very common habit now, to change the identity. I don't want to say the name of that yeshiva. Not because I'm afraid to say names. You know me, if there is a reason to announce a name, I announce the name because that's what the halacha require, to warn from the wicked. However, after I investigated the case, I found out that it's not their fault. This school used to be very modern, very modern, and was the board of that school used to be people that are more reformed than orthodox. So they made it very similar to public school. However, in the last few months or year or two, they changed everything over there. They kicked out the wicked people, they put some Torah, God-fearing people in the place, they brought a good rabbi there, and slowly, slowly, they actually saved that place. So the place is a million times better than when it was a year or two ago. A place that is on the way up, you don't want to denounce. You want to encourage in them to continue to clean the, the, the negative out of there and to make it a kosher place for, for the souls of our children. 
You understand? However, you wonder to yourself how easy today is to cheat and to trick people. It's unbelievable. The most bizarre things I heard of is that that woman, man, is married to an orthodox person with a beard and a black hat. If you tell me he's married some reform gay, okay, no surprise there. I saw that little video that someone sent me, I wanted to vomit. It's a man who became a woman married to a person with a black hat and a beard. This is what I always tell you, that the image of a person not always says who he is. <coughs> Mamash not. <sighs> what can we do? What kind of a world we live in? Someone sent me today a message about this. Remind me about it. I didn't remember to talk about it. Someone sent me a message, some tzaddik, great guy with great ashkafa, great ideology. He told me, I came to the conclusion that I want to lock myself in the house with Torah books, lock my children in a house, and never leave the house ever again. It's so dangerous to leave the house, to walk out there. There's so many horrible dangers out there. That one of them will eat you. If these crazy people, and these lunatics, and the wicked people, and the criminal. You don't know what to do anymore. Unfortunately, I identified with what he says. We are already in a situation like this. Really, not just that you know that according to the Torah, if we really, really want to stick to the dry rules of the Torah, today we are living in time that there is no permission to leave your house. That's really the truth. Definitely not to walk to Manhattan to work, or to walk in the street of King's Highway, or the streets of Main Street, when there are so many naked people, and so many wicked people, and so many anti-God people around. And there's no permission to go to any university. And most of the places that consider themselves Jewish are also not kosher. So technically, if there was a logical way to survive by locking yourself in four doors without seeing all the wicked, without the internet, without all of that, that would be our obligation. However, because it's not realistic, where are you going to get food from? How are you going to pay your bills? You have to interfere with the world. And as a result of that, you have to go and see naked people, and you have to see weakened people, and you have to see idol worshipping people, and all kinds of Nazis, and all kinds of Arab terrorists, and all kinds of liberals, and lefties, and haters of God. And not only that, you sometimes have to shake their hands. You have to shake their hands when you go and sell something or buy something. How to believe what situation Hashem put us in. As bad as it sounds, we know the rule. If Hashem put you in a test, that means you can handle it. Hashem does not give a test to a person unless he can handle it. If Hashem put us in such a test, we can handle it. When I went to Israel a month ago in the airport, I met a good friend of mine. A very sharp, clever guy, son of an important rabbi. His father published important books. We used to be very friendly many years ago. He got married, he has a family. But he's an amazing person to talk to. The entire flight, we were sitting and talking the Vret Torah. On the way to the waiting online to, to board, he told me, look at this Hasid. The Hasid is a boy, 18 years old. There was maybe 30 Hasidim, 30. They're going to yeshiva in Israel. It was Rosh Chodesh before Rosh Chodesh Elul. Right? He told me, I've been following him for an hour. Look at him. I said, what? Look how he watches his eyes. He does not look at anything. In the entire time, his head is down. When he spoke to the people, the woman on the desk, and, you know, they give the car, the boarding pass and all that, his head was down. 
when he's climbing, you know, now going into the ramp, into going to, his head is down. The entire time his head was down. Living in Sodom and not damaging his soul even one minute per month. That means it's possible. Complete, complete watching his eyes. Then I started to see that other Hasidim boys there were just as good. He was focusing on this one. I saw that some of them are mash, they have irat shamayim. They watch their eyes. They don't look at the goyim there and all the naked people. They don't look at them. They have such a guard around themselves and they are kids. They're only starting their life, these kids. 18 years old, what's 18 years old? Such a willpower. If you have such a willpower, no, you can survive in such a dirty world. How many people have such a willpower? The way to reach such a level is A, that you come from a family like this, that from tens of generations, they are holy, son of holy, son of holy, son of holy. Obviously, you don't get garbage souls into such a genealogy. It's all holy people. So a great soul comes back to the world to fix some minor things. So to begin with, that's, this is a very holy soul, son of holy, son of holy, for 20, 30, 40 generations. Okay, so when the soul is superb and is very high level, okay, now you understand why a person can reach such a high spiritual level. Then you have the garbage souls, that every minute is looking at bad things and doing bad things and speaking bad things and always attracted to negative. You see right away. But there's also the level of learning Torah. If this boy is learning 12, 14 hours a day Torah in holiness, he gives him the energy to watch his eyes. He learns Musar. His Rebbe in Yeshiva does a good job giving him the Musar he needs. So he knows when he goes to public places full of uh, wicked people, he knows how to watch his eyes. And by the way, the month of Elul is all about this. This month is an opportunity to save the entire year. 11 months is on the line here. One good month, you finish the year, everything goes achar achitum, the Gemara says. So even if a person did not prepare for his trial for 11 months, and now there is one month left before the trial, but that final month he puts his heart into preparing, Full day, all day, non-stop, preparing, collecting, writing, documenting things. When he comes to the trial, no one will know that 11 months he wasted. Because the final month was so good that he came prepared for the trial. But if the last month, he also takes it easy. Ah, big deal. Everything is usual, same prayers. Same everything, Slichot, he bar barely think about one word of what he says. No tzedakah, no nothing. Everything the same. He comes in front of Hashem in Rosh Hashanah. Hashem said to him, shame on you. You don't even care about me. Forget about, you're not afraid of what's going to happen to you. I'm the king of the universe. I give you a month to fix all your crimes before your trial, you're entering my courtroom not prepared. That means I count nothing in your eyes. For that alone, you get a special punishment before we analyze every one of your sins. For the chutzpah, that one month before the trial, you had an opportunity to erase all the negative and he didn't care at all about anything. He lived as usual, whatever happened, happened. That chutzpah add to your terrible situation. i give you an example. You know, every time I go to Israel, 90% of the donations stop. Only when I give lectures in English, people remember somehow to donate. When there's no lecture, live lectures in English, People forget that they have an obligation to donate and save souls for whatever reason. It's all a matter of either you remind them or don't. But what would you say about this, that I had 13 cancellations of recurring monthly payment the last week alone 
a week before the trial, people canceling monthly donation of $18, $50, 30-something dollars. It just shows you that people have no idea what life is about. They couldn't wait another month until after Sukkot to cancel. Just before the trial, if anything will save you is the tzedakah, tzedakah tzil mimavet. What do they do? Cut on their donations one, two, three weeks before the critical day. That means for 20 years they didn't understand anything from the lectures. How many thousands of times we repeat that sentence from the Gemara? Tzedakah tatzil mimavet. Donation, charity can rip a dead sentence verdict that was sealed and signed by Hashem against you. One nice check, one nice donation, can Hashem call this the angel of death and rip it and just give you another 10 years of life. One check. If the, now, since we are far away from being righteous, we know it, come on, let's not kid ourselves. Far away from being holy, far away from being righteous, far away from doing the right thing in the eyes of Hashem. We have only one weapon left that relatively, it's easy. It's donating. That's just a little fight with your stinginess and that's it. How long that fight can take? Two or three minutes. Once you click the button, it bothers you another minute after and it's gone. You don't even remember two hours later you just donated. The, the whole idea was a matter of few minutes of pain in your stingy heart. But after that, you done the right thing and that particular uh, charity can actually turn around your entire negative verdict to a great ear. So if there is one easy way out, is donating as much as you can. The more the better, especially the month of Elul. What do they do? Cancel. And I said, what, these people have no brain? That's the time you chose to cancel? One thing, I can give them the benefits of the doubt. Maybe they don't have what to eat. That's also crossing my mind. Feel bad for these people. So either that they are totally foolish, that they don't understand anything, and they never learn anything in the lecture for the last 20 years. Or maybe there's a different reason. Maybe these people came to a situation and they, they don't have what to eat. One of them at least told me, I'm in a situation right now that I have more expenses than income and my debt is growing every week. Should I continue to donate? No. Okay, so there are people like this, unfortunately. In an average day, you speak to people. You have one person who barely have what to eat, a minute later someone who's loaded with tens of millions of dollars. And then you go back to another miserable person who is looking for someone to help him for something that costs 50 bucks. We see the extreme. One person is flooded with wealth, one person is flooded with agony and poverty. Now you're asking yourself, what's better, to be this one or that one? To be flooded in wealth or to be flooded in poverty, what? The Gemara asked this question. It's a well-known question. The Gemara said, neither one, neither one of them. Better to be an average. Average, not rich, not poor. Not to be poor, everybody knows the answer why. If you don't have what to eat and feed your children, you become a thief. You can't handle the pressure and you go and steal. Or you borrow and don't pay back. That's what the poor people do when they don't have a munah. But then you wonder, but why not to be extra wealthy? Why not? Give me a reason why. That, that's not logical. Everybody wants to be wealthy. Because when you're very wealthy, 99.9% .9 of the time you do not pay your obligations to charity. And the punishments for that is very severe. I gave you millions and you hold it for yourself, you stingy guy. You're stealing from me? Why did I give you all this wealth for? To support Torah, to save souls 
to put your children in the best yeshivot, to support yeshivot. And what do you do? Let's see what you did. Another house, and another house, and another yacht, and another car, and another sport car, and another this, and another that, and diamonds, and jewelry, and rubies, and clothing, and 5,000 pairs of shoes. And then when someone finally needs help for the Yom Tov, eh, send him $180. Let's see what you buy in a supermarket with $180. It won't be enough for one meal for a tiny family. So the point is, to be wealthy is a huge danger. Huge. Especially people that think that they're very clever. Why don't you give? I will give one day. Right now, I don't want to waste time. I want to accumulate wealth. Money brings money. If I give a lot of charity, my, my uh, principle will not be big enough. So let me save, 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 save. Reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. And then I'll get to huge income. Then when I get to, you know, to retirement age, then I'm going to start giving a lot of money to charity. Dreams, illusions. He will not ever give anything. No matter how much he saves, it will be harder for him then to give. You know these people that are afraid to make money because they're going to have to pay taxes? So they actually have a relief that this year wasn't so great. Why are you happy? You know what? Listen, if I made another million, I have to give Uncle Sam 400,000. I have a relief that I don't have to pay that bill. But you're fool, but he had 600 left extra. He doesn't think about the positive. He thinks about the negative. There are some people who are like that. Oh, this year wasn't so good. At least I don't have to give a lot of tzedakah. You're fool. It's a punishment not to give tzedakah. Tzedakah is the only money you wire to your Olam Abba, to your eternal world. How many times I have to explain to you that whatever you do for others, whether you give them money or clothing or help them or cure them or whatever you do for them, you did nothing for them. Zero. You only did for yourself. So if you love yourself so much and you're so selfish, all your money you would give to tzedakah. Why? Because that's the only way to wire money to the next world. Because eventually when you die and you leave your money over here in a bank or in some saving, what's going to happen with that? Your children's going to use some of it? Will they use it correctly? Will they elevate your soul? Will they start hating each other and fight over it? Most likely that's what's going to happen. You're going to eat your heart in the next world for all the money you accumulated. Gave it to the spoiled American kids who doesn't appreciate anything. And then what happened? They, do, they give their life for the Torah with this money? Will they build yeshivot with this money for the, for the for, for this elevation of your soul? Will they save soul with this money? Or will they buy themselves sport cars and vacation homes? Look at the statistic of the world. Rich, spoiled kids, what do they do? Barely throw a bone to their parents, a little bone and everything to their stomach. Why? This is the way America is, and this is the way the world is. Have, have, have. Chazal have a name for it, like a dog that says, how, how, how? How means in Hebrew, have. Give, give, give. Why the dogs bark all the time? Because he wants things. That's why when the dog barks, he says, have, 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 have. Have, it's hey, bet. Have means give, 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 give. Don't be like a dog, give, give all the time, all the time complains. We have to re-educate the people because the damage that society made to their head is so severe. Uh, no matter how many times you try to save them, they keep going, they keep bouncing to the original way. It's, that's it, there's nothing you can do about it. Let me read to you something. From the parasha we read last Shabbat, Parashat Kitavo, as you know, Sefer Dvarim, Deuteronomy, it's the book that Moshe Rabbeinu, it's the speech of his life. He actually gave that speech the last 36 days of his life. Ele Adevarim, that's how it starts. Ele, numeric value, 36. 
So 36 days, Moshe gave a speech. How many chapters in the Torah this speech is, uh, this speech is are? Ten. Starting in Varim until Vezot Abracha. One of the parashot is Kitavo. Kitavo is a very, very painful and scary chapter. The hardest one in the entire Torah. It has 98 curses. Terrible curses. Beyond words. All together, the Torah have 147 curses. Punishments, curses. In the Parashat Bechukotai, you have 49. Over here, 98. What is the next chapter after Kitavo? Nitzavim. Atem Nitzavim Ayom Kulchem. Kulchem Ayom. All of you are standing in front of God from the highest level to the lowest level. The Gemara teaching us that after Moshe told them the 98 curses, they did not want to live anymore. They were so already gave up, so depressed, so uptight about it. They say, who could survive such life with so many decrees from Hashem? Better to die than to have this. What was Moshe respond to them? Don't panic. All of you are still standing here. Meaning, you can still do tshuva. Hashem doesn't immediately punish. He has patience. He gives you time to correct what you've done wrong. That's why the next parasha is always before Rosh Hashanah, Nitzavim. Kitavo will not be attached to Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because you have to first say Nitzavim, and Nitzavim means you, you are still standing, you are still alive, don't give up. However, parashat Kitavo will always be very close to Rosh Hashanah, always few days before Rosh Hashanah. Why? We have a say in a slichot, Tichle shana vekilelotea, tachel shana ubirkotea. The year, the previous year, with all its curses, should end, and the new year, with all her, its blessings, should begin. So that's why we mention all the curses right before the end of the year. Rosh Hashanah comes, it's the end of the previous year. And a new year is about to start. Now you know this year was a horrible year. One of the worst in the history of the world. Few things happened. You should know every seven years there is a Shnat Shemitah. A year that you do not work in the fields, you don't plant anything. You're not allowed to sell the fruits. You're allowed to give it to, to anyone who wants, to the poor. But you're not allowed to trade for money, for whatever grows in your fields. So, every time there is, a, there is a Shnat Shemitah, tragedies happen in the world. Holocaust, World War I, World War II, the world now in Ukraine. And always the stock market crash. Every year of the Shnat Shemitah, I have a list with details. I send it to the guy in the bank. To the guy in the bank, righteous guy who loves very much God and Torah, I sent it to him, I said to him, expect a horrible year. This was when the year began. I said, why? I said, it's not Shemitah. What Shemitah, Rabbi? I explained to him. You know how many times since then he screams to me, Rabbi, it's Shemitah, I'm dying here. Today, he spoke to me, how long? More to that Shemitah. I said, 10 more days. Less. That's it. It's over. Oh, thank God. Save us from this misery. Everything crashed 25%. It was a horrible year. People lost fortunes. The war in Ukraine messed up our life. We pay for everything double and triple. Not only we did not recuperate from COVID, came that war and knocked us out completely. You can still not get cars. You can still not get parts. Everything takes three, four times more to get. 
There's a lot of shortage in the market. There's a lot of suffering. Why the stock market is crashing? Logically, why? Very simple. Once there is a lot of inflation, the government has to raise the interest rate. When the government raises the interest rate, you pay a lot more on your mortgages, so it's knocked down the prices of the real estate. It makes real estate crash after a year or two. So it's affecting the, the housing market. There's going to be much less mortgages. Okay. And now, if you have money in your saving account or in a CD, you get 10 times more interest. Before, they gave you 0.1%. Now they're offering 4% on a CD. 3.9, 4%, soon it's going to be 5 because they're going to increase the interest rate on Wednesday another percent. That means you're going to be able to get 5% on the money you saved in the good years without doing anything. Think about it. There are people who have $10 million laying in their bank accounts. They're going to make $500,000 a year interest. Why should they put money in the stock market? You have to be an idiot to gamble on your money. Just keep it in a CD, close it for a year or two or three. The longer you keep it, the more you make interest. And you don't have to work. So people take all their money out of the stock market. Plus, the inflation still did not become any better. Now they're going to increase the interest rate by another percent. Nobody would be able to afford a mortgage. Houses that here went up to $3 million will go down to two and then to one. That's what's going to happen. If it's going to happen in the Jewish areas, not so much. Jewish religious areas usually always keep their value. Maybe it can go down 10%. Even in 2008, when everything in America crashed by 50-60% or more, in Monsi, it went down 10% the most. Why? There is a lot of demand. People want to live among a religious community. So no matter that there are 20, 30% who cannot afford, there's others that have money from the good days. They buy it in cash. They don't even need mortgage. But for the rest of America, it's going to be a disaster. People will not be able to pay their mortgage. People have adjustable mortgage. Let's say five years is finished. Until now, they were paying 4%. It will jump to 8%. Where are they going to bring another 40,000 a year interest to pay? They don't have. Energy prices are double. It's another 1,000 a month. They're not going to be able to pay. And they're going to have to produce another $4,000 just to keep the house every month. So they leave it to the bank. And the banks, they have no choice. What are they going to do? They're going to have a million foreclosures? They, they're not gonna, so what do they do? They work out a deal. OK, OK, instead of having another 20 years mortgage, let's make it 30. We had 10 more years to live. Just pay the same amount. They don't take people to courts because they're never going to end. This country, logically, is finished completely. Sleepy Joe was the final nail in the coffin. Now, of course, it's an end of Hashem. You know, only Hashem can save situations like this. Logically, there is no future here. Israel, believe it or not, financially, the state is not so bad like here. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. This Israel should have been 10 times worse than here. But for whatever reason, in Israel, it's so far stable. Israel has different problems. It's the cancer among us of these two and a half million Arabs, 90% of us wants to slaughter us alive. 90% of them. And they are very violent. And they are very cruel. The cruelty that they have is beyond words. Beyond words. You know, in Israel, when they steal your car, sometimes you have valuable things in the car, like your tefillin, things that, they, that for them is nothing. They throw it to the garbage. So there are already people in Israel who, who established connection with these criminals, these Arab criminals, that by making phone calls, they will find out who stole your car. They're not even afraid to admit. 
And if you want to get back valuable things that you have in your car, your wedding album, something that is, you know, for you, it means a lot. For them, it means zero. Now they negotiate to blackmail you how much you're willing to pay to get back your belongings. Meaning they tell you in your face, yeah, we stole your car. What can you do about it? Someone say, why don't you put a, a tracker? There's this iPhone tracker, it's stickers. <laughs> they think it's America. When someone steals the car, it's for greed. <laughs> but they're over there, they laugh in your face. Ooh, what's going to be? I, I am the one who stole your car. Call the police. Let's see if they dare to show up here. And the police say, you're on your own. What do you expect us to do? We don't have enough people. 50,000 cars a year. Each car is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollars. Average car. Remember, cars in Israel cost 2.5 more than here. If you buy a Mercedes here for 100,000 dollars brand new, in Israel it's 250,000. Same Mercedes. Why? Taxes. The government collect taxes. Why they collect so much taxes? Who's going to pay for the military? You have two and a half million Arabs inside you, wants to slaughter you every minute. You need to have a good army. You need to have a cyber unit. You need to have intelligence. You need to buy rockets. You need to put iron domes. You have to, <laughs> who's going to pay? Every missile is $100,000. Every hour an F-16 train is $50,000 gas. Special gas. $50,000 an hour, you have 100 planes a day that flies or more, and they fly a few times a day. You need millions of dollars every day just for the training of the, of the airplanes. You need food for the soldiers, you need military places, you need electric, and tons of money. But, most of the money does not go for weapon. It goes for the corruption of the leaders. They steal all the money. They steal the money. Meaning, now Germany wants to sell nuclear submarines to Israel. Each one of them is a billion dollars. Six of them, six billion dollars. Someone has to sign yes or no. That someone will receive minimum $500 million to an offshore account to sign the deal. Does Israel need those submarines? No. They have enough. What do they need? What, they want to bomb the whole world? They have enough. Against Iran and the Arab countries, they have enough. What do they need? They don't need it. But someone wants $500 million bribe. The only way to make it from the Germans is to approve the documents. That's the corruption everywhere. The corruption is destroying us. Buyers, they all receive bribes, almost all of them. People that you need permit to start building. If you give them money up front, everything goes smooth. If you don't give them, even if you do everything by the book, they do everything they can to torture you, that you did not agree to give them bribes. That's how it goes. Is it like this only in Israel? No. It's like this here. It's like this in every country in the world. Some countries is worse. There are countries like Mexico. If a policeman pull you over, he give him $5 in his face, tell him it's for you, amigo. And he begins to give you Misha Berach. Misha Berach, Avotenu Avraham, Yitzchai Vayakov. We varech et Jose, son of Yaakobo and we give him a wealthy, great life for the five dollars he gave me. And that's it. Corruption like this, on the open. Over there, the corruption is under the ground. It's not like this in the open. For instance, you're not going to tell an inspector how much I have to pay you for to approving my plans. Because from the outside, he's going to say, shame on you, you're offering me bribe. You're lucky I'm not calling the police on you. So how do you do it? You say to him, how much I have to pay and to whom to get it done fast? He said, 
there is a way. I will get back to you on it. You have to donate to that place over there. And if you do that, we would review your application in a complete different ways. Don't ask too many questions. How long it will be? Two weeks. And without that donation, two years. Do they leave you a choice? Some people are honest. They don't want to pay bribe. So they say, I'm sorry. I'm going to do it by the book. Oh, yeah, do it by the book. By the book, you should get it in three, four months. They will take your heart out. Why didn't you do this? Why this is here? Why this is this? This is too close to here. They make up things. Every time they come to inspect, they give you six, seven more things to fix. Why? Because you had the nerve to try to do it the honest way. So even someone honest, they don't, they don't let you. Do you understand what's happening? That's a corruption. Bottom line, the conclusion of everything I just said is that when there is no fear from God, everything turns to the worst possible way. That's what Abraham Avinu said. He said, Sarah is my sister. <coughs> it's not my wife. Why? Because if they'll find out she's my wife, in less than a minute, they slaughter me. Because these monsters will not dare to go with someone that belongs to someone else. But what will they do? They'll kill me in a minute. You know why I have to lie? Because everyone over here has no fear from God. If they had fear from God, they will kill someone? No. Because they don't have fear from God, for sure they're going to kill me. When there is no fear from God, the corruption is everywhere. People that have uh, fear from God, today I spoke to someone, <coughs> someone in Israel, uh, maybe a month ago, we exchanged money, and he was short 60 shekel. It's about $18. Today he called me up. You see, you know, I just realized I never paid you back that 60 shekel. I totally forgot about it the next day already. But people that have fear from God, this guy is a tzaddik from an important family of Kohanim, doesn't matter even five shekel. I will search for you the whole world to pay you back. Why? He's not afraid of me. He knows I don't care about this $18. He's afraid of Hashem. So if someone is calling you now, hey, by the way, I owe you 60 shekel. How can I give it to you before Rosh Hashanah? I don't want to enter Rosh Hashanah with money. It's not mine. Someone like this, if you have to keep him in your business, is going to touch something? Never going to touch. He's afraid of Hashem. You can put 500 cameras. If the person is a crook, he'll find a way to steal. But if you have one person that is God-fearing, you don't need cameras. He'll never dare to touch without permission. Even if he comes five minutes late, he's going to take it off the hourly salary. I, I, 20 minutes, you have, you have to get credit. Why? I came five minutes late here. I came three minutes late here. To the minute. Of course, the boss is going to say, ah, don't be silly. It's OK. Same thing with the cleaning lady. The cleaning lady, they sometimes come late. Okay, let's say they come two times a week. It's supposed to be 9 o'clock in the morning. She comes 9.15. Right? They don't, they don't have irat uh, shamayim. They don't understand mamonot. They, they bill you like they came at 9. You have to be clever not, not to make a big deal out of it. Because if you're going to do it the Torah way, they're never going to want to work for you. I say to people, let go, let go. They steal from you. You're lucky it's only this. If you're going to be pedantic, yeke, you're going to do the calculation, oh, you get paid $15 an hour, but you came 15 minutes late, so you have to give me back $4. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to hate you so much, they're going to steal your diamond rings. Everything else, because they hate you. If you treat them very nice, they'll have a little guilt. Before they steal, from you they won't steal. From you they won't steal. <laughs> we had the cleaning lady, the Spanish woman. 
She came to my garage to clean the garage. She saw all the books. I have books in Spanish. Of course, she stole one. And she went home and read it. I didn't know what happened, but one I saw she always gave respect because you know they have in the in the world there is the patron and there are the servants and they are never gonna be friends. You go to Mexico, you have the owner of a mansion and he has workers. He cannot talk to the to the owner like he's his friend or you. He's always gonna be senor, senor. It's never gonna be, oh, can I tell you about my problems at home? The boss and the cleaning lady is not talking like two friends. By us, the Jewish people, we try to be humbled. We don't feel like patron. So they can't believe it that the owner of the house is actually care about their problems and give them advice. So one time I realized that the cleaning lady changed completely her attitude to me. Like when she see me, like, she gives respect. <laughs> I say to myself, why all of a sudden she's so nervous around me? That's when a week or two later, she said that she looked into that book. Your husband is a man of the oath. I watch him on YouTube. <laughs> Same thing happened with an Arab in Israel. The Arab come to me. Rav, tireh mani roe. So I'm YouTube. I said, well, I hope he's not going to get to the, to the lecture that I criticize the, the Quran. <laughs> Imagine what's going to happen. But you have to see with what pleasure he watch my lectures in Hebrew, this Arab worker. I say to myself, I wish these lefty liberal Erev Rav Jews would have such passion to hear Torah class on YouTube and walk like this with his iPhone in the neighborhood while he's working, in the middle of work, watching lectures and enjoying the Arab. Let me read to you how much we're almost done. So the Torah speaks about splitting the Jewish nation to six tribes on Areval, six tribes on Argrizim. Areval is bad. Brown, thorns, dry. All the curses are coming from there. Argrizim is green, nice, wet, blooming. All the blessings will, are going to come from there. Tov. Now, the Torah begins to give a list. Listen to this. Based on what Rashi explained, the Torah says, Baruch mi shelo yaase pesel umasecha vesam baseter. Someone who does not make himself an idol and hide it in his house and worship that idol is blessed. Is receiving a special divine blessing. Very strange. Imagine, someone who will not murder should be blessed. Someone who, should, who will not steal should be blessed. This is unethical things. You need a blessing just because you agree not to murder? What prize you deserve? Because I'm not a murderer. Don't I deserve a prize? You deserve a smack in your face, you fool. What kind of a prize you want for not murdering people? I, uh, I do not worship any statue. Don't I deserve a blessing? Thank you very much that you're not bowing down to some stupid idol. What kind of a blessing you deserve? But the Torah apparently disagree with what I say. Based on the Torah, people like this deserve a special blessing. And we have to ask why. Some tests are very difficult. Someone who watches his eyes on the street and never look at bad things should be blessed. Absolutely. So difficult. Someone who gives tons of charity should be blessed. Great. It's difficult. It's stingy. It's giving. But someone who agrees not to murder deserves to get a special blessing? Someone who agree not to bow down to some Buddha on the street, he deserves a special blessing? Listen to this. 
I'm reading it to you. Baruch mi shelo yaase pesel umasecha vesam baseter. Bless someone who did not make a statue and hid it in his house. Right after that, Arur ha'ish asher yaase pesel umasecha vesam baseter. The opposite. Someone who actually made a statue and hid it in his house to worship it should be cursed. Tov. Positive, negative. Tov. Continue. Baruch mi sheeno shochev in chotanto. Blessed be the one who does not sleep with his mother-in-law. Go to any go in America. Say to him, tell me, do you think it's a positive thing to go and, and uh, cheat on your wife with, with her mother? You're out of your mind. Most goyim understand that without Torah. Forget about atheist goyim. I don't know, find an atheist goy somewhere in a university. And tell him, wow, you deserve a real special medal. Why I deserve a medal? Because you did not go with your mother-in-law. What? <laughs> what do you think of me? What do, I, what do I look to you like? I'm uh, completely crazy? But the Torah says, someone who did not go with his mother-in-law should be blessed. Very strange. Right after that, curse be the one who goes with his mother-in-law. Tov. Continue. Continue. The Torah says, Arur mashgei ver baderech. Curse be the one who put a trap in front of a blind man on the way, on the way. And blessed be the one who does not set a trap in front of a blind man on the street. Obviously, that's not literal. What kind of a human being will see a blind person walk on the street and put a stick on the, on the floor for, to trap him to fall? What? You, you're, not a, you're not a human being, if you're willing to do such thing. Where is your head? You need to be religious not to do such a thing. Here we are not really talking about a blind person. We're talking about a blind person in this field. Meaning, we have an old couple that are disconnected from the world. They don't know the value of their house. So you try to force them to sell the house for $100,000 when it's worth a million. They are still in the days that they bought it for 50. They're not advanced with the world. My grandmother was like this. I used to go every Friday with the bus to visit her and to enjoy her special kube that she used to make. And whenever I wanted to leave, she always had the question, did you put Phil in today? And the second question was, let me give you the money for the bus. And she used to take money that wasn't even 5% of the cost for the bus because in her days, the bus used to be such and such, you have no idea. And I used to pretend that I'm using this money for the bus. We couldn't even buy a gum with this money. So they are in their own world. They're not connected to the media. They don't know there's inflation. Yeah, she's still 20 years back then when this money was enough for a bus. So imagine someone come, the people used to trick her. She used to have a phone. When they brought phones to the houses in Israel 40 something years ago, not everybody had the right to have a phone. They didn't have enough lines. So who got a phone? Only someone that their son died in a war. They had the first priority. And she lost a son, 17 years old, in a battle with the Arabs in 1947 in Ramle. His general was Menachem Begin, Alava Shalom. And he was 17 years old and he died, protecting, creating the, the, the Israeli state. It's because it's called Mishpacha Shakula, because they lost a the child, they had the right to have a phone. No one in the neighborhood had a phone. So all day people were waiting online to use her phone and to pay her for the call. But some people cheated. Every month my father used to say, wow, the phone bill is three times more than what the money that you got. She didn't know. People know, saw that she's, she doesn't know about money. Let's say it was two shekel per call, they give her half a shekel. All the crooks out there. 
That's called Arur Mashge Iver Baderech. Someone who takes advantage on someone who has lack of knowledge or he has no idea. Fooling him in such a way, you have a special curse. Now I want to finish with asking why Hashem had to go to such spe specific details. And the answer, Rabotai, is the highlight is on the word Baseter. The Torah didn't say, blessed be the one who doesn't bow down to an idol, no. The Torah say, blessed be the one who does not do it in hidden rooms. Because when it's in the open, no one will dare to do such thing. Nobody steals in the open, and nobody rapes in the open, and nobody murders in the open in front of everyone. When people want to commit these crimes, they do it in hidden places that nobody witnesses it. They check, no cameras, no thing, they hide their face. Once you are alone, the desire is 10 times higher. To bow down to an idol on the street in front of all the religious Jews, who would dare to do such thing? But when they go call you in hidden room and say to you, come, your son is sick, right? He's about to die. Come to my idol, I'll tell you certain words to say. You see, your son is going to be healthy tomorrow. So the first thing you say, anyone here is going to be there? No, no, it's in my basement. It's only me and you and, and my God. Ah, no one is going to be there? Okay, he goes and do it. So the Torah knows the psychology of a person. When it's hidden, the Yetzer Ara is growing ten times higher. When it's in the open, you don't deserve a blessing. Why? Society is a guard. You don't dare to do such things in the public. But when no one sees, it's in hidden rooms, even when his own mother-in-law can go. You're thinking, how can it be? Very simple. Women used to get married in age 12. Age 13, they already have a child. This child will be 13 in 13 years. How, much the mother, how old the mother's going to be? 26. 26, and her daughter is 13. And the 13 marry a guy 18. He's 18, and a beautiful woman, 26, is hitting on him. She's, uh, you know, nothing, there's no gut feeling. That's very, part. today it's, it's less likely because of the difference on the ages. The girl is 20, the mother is 45, 50 maybe. It's very unlikely. But in the time of the Torah, the Jews and the Goim used to get married very, very young. And they give birth in a very young age. So the mother, mother, on the mother and daughter, it's very common to give birth in the same week. Why? What's the problem? The mother continued to give birth and the daughter was giving birth. It was a little bit different, the world, than the way it became. I will finish with one story uh, we all should remember for the rest of our life. In a Gemara in Masechet Gitin Nun Chet, there was a story about a carpenter that had a student that he was teaching him the art of carpent carpentering. And uh, one time the assistant started to like the wife of this carpenter. One time the carpenter didn't have money, he needed a loan. The assistant suggested to give him a loan. Send your wife to my house, I'll give her the money. When the wife came, he locked her in a room for three days. He locked her in a room. Remember, there were, people lived far from each other, so they had to go on a donkey, it takes time. So the husband saw his wife didn't come back until he realized that something happened. He's now, there's no telephone, so he has to go and find out what happened. When he came to him, he said, I sent her right away. I don't know what happened to her. But I heard that the boys around here abused her. And she actually liked one of them. And she went with him. What kind of a wife you have, boss? If you're smart, take my advice. Give her a get, divorce her. The man said, naive and fool the carpenter, but I don't have enough money to pay her ktuba. He said, don't worry, I'll lend you the money. Just get rid of her. You don't deserve such a wife. 
He gave him the money. This fool went and gave a get to that woman. What happened right after that? Three months later, he finds out that his assistant, the crook, got married to her. Why three months later? When a woman gets the divorce, you have to wait three months until you allow her to get remarried. Why? Because in case she's pregnant from her first husband, you, have an, you need enough time to see if she's pregnant. There's no, like today, DNA, you can check who's the father. But in the old days, if she gets married a, a day after she got divorced, and then after three months you see that she's pregnant, you'll never know who the father is, the first one or the second. So you need to wait three months, it's enough for the stomach to grow. If after three months they see she's not pregnant, they allow her to get married. Three months later, he's married already. A year came by, and he said to the boss, what about the loan? You're not paying me back. He said, I don't have. He said, okay, I have an idea. Why don't you come and work for me? Be my servant in my house. Take care of the garden, cook, go to bring water from the well. Slowly, slowly, until you finish to pay your debt. So he said, okay, if I have to pay you back, and that's the only way, I'll do it. He came to work for him, and he sees his ex-wife living happily with this crook. So as he serves them wine and food, his tears are falling into the wine. And they drink and enjoy, and he's crying, and all the tears goes into the drink. The Gemara said, that time Hashem signed on the destruction of Jerusalem. Meaning Hashem was very angry at the Jews and he was about to destroy the second temple. But there was no final verdict yet. It was cooking. This day that the tears of this man fell into the drink, seeing his ex-wife with that crook, that second Hashem said, I signed the death sentence of the Beta Mikdash and hundreds of thousands of Jews are going to die. Now we have to ask a question. How Hashem punished hundreds of thousands of people for something that this low life did? Why not to hang him or to send a snake to choke him? Why do you have to punish hundreds of thousands of people and to burn the temple for it? What's the connection? Why other people had to die because of this person? What, everybody agree with such a thing? The answer is, Rabotai, if you really go even deeper, this person technically, did he break the Jewish law? She got divorced. She was a divorced woman, and he went and married her. Light was before, but right now when he lived with this woman, she's a divorced woman, and he, he married her. In Hebrew, oh, in Hebrew we have a say, kasher aval masriach. Kosher, but stink. Meaning, oh, you want to stick to the dry law? I cannot convict you. But everyone agreed that it's unethical what you did. For something like this, are you being punished by Hashem? Or you can say, I didn't break the law. The Ramban say, Naval Bershut Torah, a villain, villain that used the Torah to act on his wickedness. So he already, it's like those lawyers, they know the line. But you see, crook, 100% a crook. So listen, what happened, Rabotai? The Yavet say, even though he didn't really break a clear rule of the Torah, we have one rule in the Torah that is worse than all the other sins. What you hate people doing to you, don't do to others. Man desane alech, al taase lechaverach. You don't want people to do it to you. Everything you hate people doing to you, make sure you don't do to others. There is one sin that Hashem is very angry at, that you're willing to do something that you hate other people doing to you. So now I want to ask you a question. Why thousands of people had to suffer? The answer is because not one of them came to protest. They saw what this crook did, 
They saw how he took the wife of that boss. They saw that he became their servant. And now one person say the word about it. That means a society that are so corrupted that they're willing to agree with such evilness that Hashem says, if that's what the people became, they have no right to breathe. And definitely, I don't want to see their lousy face in my house, in Bet HaMikdash. So he burns the Bet HaMikdash, and he burns them with it. And the Roman came, and they slaughtered them. There were rivers of blood on the streets of Beitar. Hundreds of thousands of bodies. And not only that, on top of all that, Hashem made that the Romans did not allow them to bury the bodies for three years. But he made sure that the bodies didn't smell, because if the body would smell, the Romans themselves would want to bury them. They couldn't take the smell. So Hashem actually cooperated with the evilness of these Nazi Romans just to punish us. He made a miracle that three years the bodies didn't smell. And you know what the Romans did with the bodies? They used it for construction. They made fences. They took ten bodies, one on top of the other, tied it together with a rope, and they made fences around their houses. Instead of building with wood, we have millions of bodies here. Let's just use them for construction. Imagine you walk in the street and you see your grandfather in a fence of this Nazi Roman, your rabbi, your grandfather. Think about it. Naked bodies like this. For three years they didn't smell. And that's after three years on Tu Be'av. This decree was cancelled and they got permission to bury the bodies. And this is the story that finalized that horrible holocaust. Why? People lost their ethics. They are worse than animals. Even by animals there are rules. There are certain rules they won't break. If people are willing to live with such a person and shake his hand and no one is protesting, like today, we have my blacklist, all these infidels, these her heretic speakers that destroys the world, destroys the world. When I got on a plane back from Israel, I see one Chabadnik, black hat and a beard, Immediately I realized he's a Chabadnik, and I already saw that he wants to say something to me. And I say, if the Chabadnik wants to say something to me, I already guess what is it about. So I got even closer to him, to make it easier for him. Just when we got together on a sleeve to go into the plane, you Rabbi Mizrahi, right? No, yeah, what? What do you have against this speaker? I heard you very much condemn him. But serious, I, I'm not questioning your causes. I'm sure you're for the sake of heaven. Oh, sure. But I'm wondering what are you talking about? He's great. I say to him, yes, he's great. Do you have an email? Yes. What's your email? Rabbi such and such. As we talk, I have it in my phone, a collection of his jewels. I said to him, I'm in row 54. You are in 30 something. Where are you sitting? 30 something. I'm in 50 something. I'm very close to you. Read it and come to where I sit. We continue the discussion. Of course, I, needless to say, I never saw his face ever again. And we'll never see his face because he's going to hide for the rest of his life. After he read what I had to say, I'm sure he, he, he was reading Tehillim the entire flight that I won't come to him. I said to him, believe me, after you read what I have to say about him, I want to see your face after you read. While we were talking, I told him some of the things by heart. Ma, I never heard him saying this. You sure? I said, you, you think I'm making up stories about people? Yes, absolutely. You want to see the video? Slowly, slowly started to get the point. If you don't know, why are you talking? Why are you talking? Somebody make an accusation against someone. Listen to the whole story first. Approach them. Can you send me what you're talking about? Can you send me a proof? There are people who want proof. 
They ask for proofs. You give them proofs. Some accept it. Some are politicians. They don't care about the truth. They just want to know what you have against them that they'll know what to say. They really never care to begin with to do the right thing. I say to him, this guy is the biggest infidel in the last 2,000 years. There was nobody that makes more damage to Judaism like him. What? At Kedekach? Say yes, absolutely. He murdered already thousands of souls. He actually make people become enemies of Hashem with his nonsense. He made Hashem nothing. He's mamash a disgrace. He's an enemy of Hashem with the nonsense that he spreads. Makes Hashem like some kind of a shoebox. He needs us. He couldn't be without us. What does he have against us? What right he has to punish us? Homosexuality, it's not an abomination. It's a sin. He has his sin. You have your sin. I have my sins. Together, all of us will commit all the sins of the Torah. <laughs> That's how he talks. What he is, I already know. I'm wondering to myself, how there are so many stupid people left in this world? They need me to tell them what you don't see in front of your eyes? The answer is they see. But nobody cares about the truth. Just like this story. Nobody cares. They only care if this guy is in my group or is not. If he's in my group, I must defend him. I must defend him. Doesn't matter, he's one of me. I don't care what he did. Just remember the O.J. Simpson trial? The Jewish lawyer and the black lawyer did everything they can to put few black people on the jury. Why? Black people don't convict black people. If it was a Hasidic Jew on trial, they would do everything they can to put four or five Hasidim in a jury. Why? Because they know the nature of people. People don't care about the truth, they care about who is this guy on trial. Is one of us, I have to defend him. But he's a murderer. Doesn't matter, I have to defend him. What about the truth? What about Hashem thinking? What Hashem thinks about it? Nobody cares. The best thing today in Elul, a week before the Rosh Hashanah trial, is to accept on ourselves that the truth is above everything. I don't care, Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasid, this kind, Chabad, Breslev, doesn't really matter. What he said, comply with the rules of the Torah, I admire him for that. What he said, contradict the rules of the Torah, I will fight the nonsense that is spread in every possible way. Why? This is our obligation. It doesn't matter, I'm Moroccan, is Moroccan. I'm Yemenite, is Yemenite. I'm German, is German. Who cares about this nonsense? I'm white, is white. I'm black, is black. That's how you determine the truth? By the color of the skin of the person or by what group he belongs to? That shows you how low, how low we came. When a bunch of Ashkenazim came to Rav Aaron Leib Steineman, Gdol Ador, he was older than 100 years old, complaining about one Sfaradi boy who doesn't really belong in that Talmud Torah that they have, that it's so superb, with great families. All the families are Bnei Torah. But that Sfaradi boy, his parents are not Bnei Torah. The father is a working man. He's like a, a pin in the neck, in a nice way. They are trying to convince this holy rabbi, who, who is also Ashkenazi, that that Sfaradi boy doesn't really belong. Please rule to us that we can throw him out. What they never expected is the attack he started to attack him, because first of all, he never attacks anyone, because he's such a tzaddik, and so down to earth, and so polite. Nobody ever saw him attacking anyone until that video. This video is on YouTube. He started to attack them. Shame on you. All, all you are is about Gaiva. Gaiva, I started to scream. Ego, ego, it's all ego. Why this kid is less than the other kids? They never saw it coming. 
That's when you're really holy and righteous. You don't care this kid came from that one and this one and from there. Who cares about the shtuyot? It's a Jewish neshama here. But he was holy. For him, all Jewish neshama doesn't matter. Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasid, Temani, converts. It's all the same. How can I be a politician? Ah, it's not one of us. Of course, get rid of him. For sure, his family is bad influence on yeshiva. Why? You checked? No, but he's Faradi, and obviously I understand already he's not good. That's politics. Ah, he doesn't belong here. Why? He's not one of us. What kind of nonsense is this? This is what I call pure racism, pure ego, pure nonsense, and people have to finally make tshuva about it, do repent about it, because if you come to the trial in front of Hashem hating other Jews because of their nationality or their color or their wealth or their brightness or their foolishness or whatever, that's how you judge people, you don't have that much of a chance to pass the test. Because the way you judge others, that's how Hashem judge you. If you're racist against other people, racism will be used against you in your trial. If you don't like people that are innocent, you're gonna pay the price. You don't have mercy on people that deserve mercy, nobody will have mercy on you. You don't care about people that suffer, they don't care about you when you suffer. You don't care about Hashem children to bring them back and start opening your wallet and start giving donations to save souls. When your children will have problems, nobody will care about them. Mida ke neged mida. I told one woman from the community, you want to save your children? You want them to succeed? You want them to be accepted to good yeshivot? There is one magic that I suggest to you. She said, why? I say, logically, the chance that your kids will be accepted to good yeshivot from the house you're coming and due to the fact that you're Baal Tshuva, it's close to zero. But in the end, it's Hashem's decision. So you want Hashem to help you? Help his children. What do you mean? Donate a lot of money to save souls. The money that I'm going to use to save other people and make them Shomrei Shabbat and become more religious, you bringing Hashem's children back to him, there is no way he will ignore you. You have to see the email she wrote to me two weeks ago. Children in the best yeshivot. Hashem made one miracle after the other for her. I said to her, I told you, that's the only way it works. Measure for measure. Mida ke neged mida for good or for bad, God forbid. And Bezrat Hashem, we're not going to be here next week because it's Rosh Hashanah. Please check my calendar when will be the next lecture. Maybe it's going to be after Sukkot. Tomorrow I speak in Brooklyn and Bezrat Hashem on Wednesday in Great Neck by Rav Alon Shul. Motzei Shab, it's Saturday night. There's a big event in Or Natan, the new location in Queens Boulevard. I start speaking at 11 o'clock until 12.30 and then it's going to be Slichot. And after Slichot, there's going to be a Tarat Nedarim, cancelling all the vows of the year. It's very important to come. And Or Natan, look at the flyers in my pages and also in my website on the, on the calendar. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer.